Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this study this week. This is the first day of the week, of course. And uh, we're continuing uh, our study in Judges, dealing with Gideon. And uh, we're going to um, be looking at the line of Gideon, but we're going to finish off uh, a little bit with the uh, line of uh, Jeroboam. So before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are, are grateful for the studies that we have here each morning. And we invite your presence to be here, to teach us, to correct us, to develop in us a Christ-like character, that we can represent you. And we know, Lord, that the truths that you give us, if we obey them and allow them to do their work, uh, they will remove self and, uh, and and invite your presence into our lives. Help us to be faithful in the little things you give us to do each day. Be with each person in their personal struggles. We pray for each person in this movement. And those that have been following these studies, we know, Lord, that as we are given light, we are given greater and greater responsibility uh, with that light. And we know, Lord, that uh, truth is to show us um, your character and the sins that lie in that darkness. Help us to understand uh, the things that we study this morning. Correct us in any errors we may hold. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Good morning again. Now, um, when we went through Gideon, so in, in going through the story of Gideon, um, uh, we had separated out, you know, six, seven, and eight as separate lines. And then we did a line of uh, uh, Jeroboam and a line of Gideon. Now, we also... Um, had taken a line having to do with Gideon's ephod. And we also have um, this part, the death of Gideon. So, and I think that this, even though we've, we've sort of addressed it, uh, the way that I would look at it when we, we put this line together, the line of Jeroboam, uh, we would put this waymark, the fourth angel arriving, we would put this as Gideon's ephod. Now, um, and I don't think we drew the line out. Um, so we had Joseph's, yeah. So we didn't really draw it out as a line, but we could see that Gideon's ephod is what happens in connection with this date, January 11th, 2023. That it's, it, and it, it begins before there and it extends after there. Uh, but it's really about this date. And so I'm just going to write this at the bottom here just to fill it in. And that is going to be uh, Judges 8.22 to 8.28. So I'll do it this way. Eight twenty-two to twenty-eight. It's Gideon's ephod. Does that make sense to people, what, what I'm talking about here? Because Gideon's ephod is this misuse of chronology. And we can see its application here in this time. Right, so, so we had gone through it. I don't know why we didn't really draw it on a line. So that um, 
Now here in, in these lines, you can see that January 11th is, um, ends up being this uh, third angel arriving in each of these individual lines. And um, then when we look at this line here, um, Jeroboam and Gideon, you can see that uh, the third angel arriving here is December 25th, 2021. And so that may be puzzling to people. But the fourth angel arriving has two different dates, January 11th and December 25th. Now we know both of these represent the 10th day of the 10th, or the, yeah, the 10th day of the 10th month. Or pardon me, the first day of the 10th month, that's it. So December 25th, 2022 is um, the first day of the 10th month. Right? Like literally on the biblical calendar. What's the significance of the first day of the 10th month? What, why, where do we get the first day of the 10th month? The end of the period of the casting off of the uh, strange wives. Right. So it has to do with uh, the period of the divorcement, right? So the divorce is going to start on the first day of the 10th month, and it's going to end on the first day of the first month. And so we can see from here, we have symbols of that, um, in that uh, when we went to April 5th, 2030, and we counted the number of months, it was 88 months, which is 88 days. And that connected us to, to January 11th, 2023. So it's 2,640 days between these dates. So January 11th is, typic, is in type, in symbol, the first day of the 10th month. But December 25th, 2022 is also literally on the biblical calendar, the first day of the 10th month. And so both of these dates come together. They're really the same way mark. December 25th, 2022, and January 11th, the 12th, 2023. They're the same, same way, Mark. And that comes from the story of Ezra. So when we um, dealt with here, so here, what we need to do is we need to show that this also in, um, in Ezra, So I can't remember, it's 10 verse, I'll just put Ezra 10. It becomes uh, the first day of the 10th month as a symbol. I did that back, but I don't know how I did that. First day, 10th month. Oh, I see what I did. I'm not even looking at what I'm doing, so... Ezra 10, there we go. There, first day, 10th month. And um, that's also going to be true in the line of Gideon, right? So this is going to be, I'll put this one down here. First day, 10th month. And then we also have these two uh, eight way marks that are the eighth, right? So we're going to have to address that as well. So, so when we look at these lines, we remember that the line of Gideon is a zoom into 11.9. It's a zoom into November 9th, 2019. Yet, we know when we zoom into a way mark, it has a line and that these uh, way marks in any particular line can be different way marks in other lines because each line has its own period of darkness and its own particular messages 
that are then uh, being addressed. And, and often it's an amplification of, and well, mostly it's an amplification of the line above. <clears throat> so when we deal here with Gideon Zephod, um, dealing with the first day of the 10th month, we can see that this is addressing uh, this period of this divorcement that happens. We know that Gideon Zephod is um, uh, it's, it's connected with this after the death of Gideon. So Gideon has to deal with the message of July 18, right? Even though it's zoom into Waymark of 11.9, it's that message that comes on November 9th, which is the message of July 18th. And so it's something that happens. I mean, it happens at the end. Gideon is victorious. And then they build this ephod. And then we have the death of Gideon. Now, my view is that the death of Gideon would be represented by this April 5th, 2030 date. So I wanted to address that uh, point. So let's look at the death of Gideon again. Now, we don't necessarily need to, 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 to draw out a line of the death of Gideon, just like we did with the ephod, though. I know we could. Um, but it says... Uh, in chapter 8, verse 29, and Jeroboam the son of Joash went and dwelt in his own house, and Gideon had threescore and ten sons of his body begotten, for he had many wives. Now we know that this 70 sons represents the 70 weeks. So how do we, and, and of course, um, here in this story, it's Gideon hasn't died yet. So it's going to mention the 70 weeks, right, symbolically. And his concubine that was in Shechem, she also bare him a son whose name he called Abimelech. So it's giving us this background story about the fact that he had 70 sons because he had many wives, but he had a concubine that had this son whose name was Abimelech. And Gideon, the son of Joash, died in a good old age and was buried in the sepulcher of Joash, his father, in Oprah of the Abba, Abba Ezrites. And it came to pass, as soon as Gideon was dead, that the children of Israel turned again and went a whoring after Balaam and made Baal Bareth their God. And the children of Israel remembered not the Lord their God, who had delivered them out of the hands of all the enemies on every all their enemies on every side. Neither showed they kindness to the house of Jeroboam, namely Gideon, according to all the goodness which he had shown unto Israel. So we know that the children of Israel, once Gideon dies, he's they're going to forget, right? Forget God. Now, if we say that the message of Gideon is the message of July 18, normally wouldn't we just put the death of Gideon at July 18, or or not, or do we put it somewhere else? Why? Where? What would cause us to decide where to put this this story? If we place the death of Gideon at July 18th, are we placing then the end of FFA at that point as well? Okay. See, so. So if we put it at July 18th, it, it would be the message of July 18th, but we know the message of July 18th hasn't ended yet. Right. So this would have to be the end of that message. Okay. But it's also going to give us this preamble to that. That is, we come to the death of Gideon, and of course, then at the death of Gideon, all these bad things are going to happen, right? They're going to forget they're the Lord God of Israel, right? And they're going to forget about their deliverance. So um, what I had been suggesting is that we have Gideon's ephod. And Gideon's ephod we're placing at um, this repeat of history, which is the fourth angel arrives in the line of Jeroboam. 
So even though it doesn't really, um, and, and the reason why is because it says, and Jeroboam the son of Joash uh, went and dwelt in his own house. So we have Jeroboam mentioned here. And um, so we have Gideon's ephod, which I also place at a fourth angel arriving. Right. So in this line of Jeroboam, uh, we're going to put Gideon's ephod here. And maybe this isn't the correct way to place it. Maybe I would even separate these two out. I mean, one would be on one line, one on another. But the point is with Gideon's ephod, we have um, a representation of the misuse of chronology that exists in this movement presently. Right. So that's Gideon's ephod. So I put it here at uh, the first day of the uh, 10th month symbolically, which we mark as January 11th. So it's 2,640 days to April 5th, the first day of the first month. So it's 88 months, 88 days. Um, and then I'm saying that we would put the death of Gideon as a line uh, that's marked on April 5th, 2030. So this is what I'm suggesting, whether this is correct or not. We would have the death of Gideon marked here at the and both of these are an arrival of the fourth message the first one here Gideon's ephod would parallel Millerite history after 1844 uh, that results ult ultimately in the development of the Seventh-day Adventist church and but also the rejection of the first and second angels messages right so this is a, a failed reform line that happens and we can see how that would be happening in connection with these predictions regarding Trump and so forth. Uh, then we have um, uh, the death of Gideon. And what I'm saying is that the death of Gideon would be representing um, this April 5th, 2030 date. So that is in this period of time between Gideon's ephod and the death of Gideon, is this period of the divorcement, right? That is, it's taking these two dates that represent that. But with the death of Gideon, there is also this forgetting. Now, in, in this story, in the story of Gideon, this forgetting is, of course, a bad thing, right? They're forgetting their Lord, their God, and not remembering, you know, how he led them. But this April 5th, 2030 date, we're not really sure what it means. That is, we don't know what, we, we don't think that it's marking some event that we need to predict. We think that it's a symbolic date. And um, there has to be, at some point, an abandonment of not everything we learned about July 18th, but as far as using uh, time, in the way that we are presently uh, marking these events, at some point that ends. We don't know what that point is or what event marks the end of that, but we know that we're not always going to be looking at uh, the events as we're passing through them and marking the dates and seeing spans of time. Because this is something particularly for this movement. That's what we, we came to understand very early on, I understood this in 2018, that any time that we had could not be about the events that Ellen White says we cannot know the time of, right? So we can't know the time of the Sunday law or the outpouring of the latter rain or of the close of probation or of any other promise of special significance. We can watch and wait. Now watch and waiting can refer to seeing events after they pass and maybe, you know, seeing that they have some significance chronologically. But we are looking at these events as light for our, our feet, which is a little bit different. That is, it's helping us as we're moving through these events to recognize the various messages that exist within the, this movement, whether they're truth or whether they're error. And, and this happened also with Parminder. We could tell that Parminder was teaching error based upon the chronology that was being given to us. 
And so, so right now, that's the, the role of time in this movement. But at some point, this movement ends. That is, all of these things that we're doing right now, they have a purpose, but their purpose ends at some point. We're not going to be, this. all these things that we're doing are not going to be our message to the Levites. Some of these things, you know, dealing with the past, understanding uh, the story of Ezra, and its connection with Millerite history and the story of Joseph and the structures and the chiasms of the prophetic periods, those are going to be a part of our message because those things are going to be a witness to Seventh-day Adventists that Adventism is correct and that the foundation was laid down correctly. It's part of examining the foundation. And we know that that's going to be our message. Those are going to be the things that we're sharing with other Seventh-day Adventists. All of these other little details about what's happened in the movement, uh, these are really not going to be relevant to them. So, so the death of Gideon has to address that point. So if we go back to these verses, we know that if we put these on a line, um, that, and I'm not sure how, how I would do that. I mean, where we, where would we have the time of the end is the time of the end, um, you know, where our line ends in the sense of December 25th, 2021, uh, because where Jeroboam, the son of Josh went and dwelt in his own house, um, and Gideon had three score and ten sons of his body begotten, for he had many wives. So, so what is this story? Uh, I mean, it's going to be the story of Abimelech, right? That, that, that's going to be the next chapter. So we could say that this death of Gideon uh, serves as a basis for the start of Abimelech's line. Do people understand what what I'm trying to say here? Let's... I think you you've you've made the point. Let's see if I it, let's see if there's something that we can we can read that is going to reinforce this point. Okay. Uh, yeah. In this situation, uh, signs of the times, August fourth of eighteen eighty one has has an article that I think may support the premise that you just made. Okay. Now, the first, the first paragraph is a recap of Judges 8, 34, and 35. The course of Israel after the death of Gideon is thus described by the sacred historian. The children of Israel remembered not the Lord their God, who had delivered them out of the hands of all their enemies on every side. Neither showed they kindness to the house of Jerubal, namely Gideon, according to all the goodness which he had showed unto Israel. So those that's how the the verses read, right? Yep. Okay. Now the second paragraph of this article, when men cast away the fear of God, they need not be surprised to see them departing from the path of honor and integrity. They are following another guide. They hurry on in the journey of life heedless, presumptuous, yet ever fearful and dissatisfied, for they have left the only one who can give them rest and security. When once started in a wrong path, many press on as if infatuated, although every step leads them farther from the source of light and the tower of strength. So in the first sentence here, when men cast away their fear of God, we need not be surprised to see them departing from the path of honor and integrity. At the death of Gideon, Israel begins to cast away their fear of God. And what is what what do we say about the fear of God? Um. Well, the fear of God is beginning of wisdom. 
is it also not the first angel's message? Yeah. Okay. So it's a rejection of the first angel's message. Here's so, yeah. so here the situation is that Gideon has shown them exactly how to enter into the rest that God would have them observe. And yet they're casting this away as they are now going to be choosing Abimelech. So this starts the first, the, the line all over again. Right. So, um, yeah. So when we look at uh, how we draw out these lines, we know that when we have that way mark, so we have this first angel arrives. Right. And then we have, um, you know, that first angel arrives, it can be, it's a way mark, but it can be a line. And we have the first angels formalized. It can also be a line. Now, we haven't drawn out every single line um, for every way mark, but we know that we, we can do this. Now, when we get to a fourth angel arriving, that we know by definition is a line that's a repeat of these first three messages. Right? Right. But normally, there is a rejection of a message that occurs. Um, with the, in the first generation, right after you have a major reform line, you have a fourth angel arriving, and you would have uh, this repeat of history uh, that includes a rejection of some of the, the light from those former messages. Right. Not everything, because the reform line is still moving on, and so there's new light that has come that is still then going to be built upon. And, and when the fourth angel arrives then at the end... So when it, you actually have the next major reform line after a progressive destruction of four, then you have uh, a revival of those lines that had existed before. So we're in our line. If you're looking at this, this would be Millerite history. This would be the early Adventist history. And this would be our history. Right. That's how we would look at this. So to see the four angel arriving twice in a row. That's what happens in our history. And, and we can see that in connection with uh, um, what even happens in 1888, right? So, you know, you could put 1863, but even when you go into 1888, 1888 is also uh, a reform line where the mighty angel of Revelation 18 has come down. And, and Jones is going to mark that in 1892, so, so these lines, in a sense, they become uh, fairly complex in, in that they're very involved, but you can see the logic of these things, that every movement in every time we have a movement that can be characterized as a reform line. Even in a period of, of a falling away, there still is a reform line. Because light is always coming to God's people amidst this darkness, right? If you have darkness, you're, you're going to have light uh, having to be revealed. And, and we could even look at during the Dark Ages, the Reformation, is that a reform line? Is reform going on during the Dark Ages, during the period of papal supremacy, 1260 years? We see ref a reformation, right? By definition, the Reformation is a reform line. Yet it's not the major reform line prophetically. That is, there are reform lines that are connected with these major prophetic periods. And so the Millerites is a major reform line. And its repeat of history in our time is, is a major reform line. What's happening in this movement is not a re major reform line. We're part of a bigger reform line because that major reform line has a prophetic marker, which is 1989, which is Daniel 11, verse 40, B, a time of the end. That's a part of major prophecies. But what's happening within that major reform line is our reform line. Right. 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 And, and this took us time to understand. I don't think we really understood it until after July 18, even though 
we should have. And I definitely had an idea that that was what was happening, that all of this time was representing something internal within this movement and, and couldn't be addressed um, by knowing when the Sunday law is going to be and all these things that Ellen White says we can't know. So I knew from the beginning, we, Ellen White's statements are going to stand. Parminder taught that they don't stand because we're in a different dispensation. And I understood what that meant. I understood, I understand dispensationalism. And, and I had to consider whether that was possible, but I know, knew the implications of it were really, to some degree, uh, um, a complete rewriting of Adventism. And, and of course, a rejection of the spirit of prophecy and also the Bible in the way that we understood it. So I, so I knew that, but I still considered it because I have to consider things. But the, the chronology showed us that Parminder was in error. Because when we look back at the Bible, we could see how all of these chronological structures had witnessed to July 18. And Parminder's rejection of July 18 was evidence that he was not following God. Because God wouldn't have given us all of this evidence if it was not true. And it couldn't have come from Satan. Because Satan doesn't have control over the sun and the moon and the stars and all the events of history. He can have control some things but he can't control those things because we know God sits enthroned above all the play and counterplay of human events. And, and so we can see that God is in control. And so all these things began to fall together. Once I recognized that what Parminder was, do, what he was doing was a rejection of July 18, then it was clear what, where Parminder fit into these lines. And, and it should have been clear to all of us. So now we have um, this, this line. And so when we're zooming into these, these lines, these lines are talking about what's been happening in the movement right now. So Gideon's ephod, definitely we can apply that to, um, um, to um, you know, what's, what's been happening with Colin. Right with with his prediction, and not just Colin, other people. So so we know that we have to use chronology correctly, and that chronology can't tell us about the Sunday law, the timing of the Sunday law. So right, yeah. Okay. So in the in the way that that you're trying to approach this, if if we look at this with these predictions that others have been making. Mm -hmm. especially where we are in seeing them involve political situations such as this with Mr. Trump. Yeah. Is this not a mixing of the common with the sacred, which we are not supposed to do? Okay. So this is a, an important point. So one of the things that we saw, is you know happening with chronology is the mixing of the common and the sacred so if we think about how chronology works if we think about these symbols we can't misuse them right so there's nothing wrong with us looking at our lives and and you know and seeing when we're born and when we got married and when our children were born and and seeing that there, these symbols exist with in our lives right because obviously, um, you know, God knows the number, numbers of hairs on our head, and he uses numbers as a witness, right? But I can't guide my life by numbers, right? Correct. Right? We're, we don't believe in numerology. It's just like when I look at the stars and I look at the calendar, you know? The fine line between what we're doing in numerology has to do with, am I going to determine when I do something based upon the date that it is? If I choose to do that, I am trying to manipulate God, right? Correct. 
I'm trying to manipulate my destiny. But if I look back and I see that God's hand is in my life, um, that's different, right? And so, so there's there's this this fine line, and 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 we're going to see these symbols everywhere because they're ubiquitous in the sense that once you once you recognize a number, I mean, you're not going to notice when you look at a clock and it said five twenty five, you know, three or four years ago. But now you look and it says five twenty five. Oh, you think oh five twenty five? That's you know from July eighteenth to December twenty fifth, you know, twenty twenty to 2021 you're gonna you're gonna think about that or if it's 9 11 you're gonna say oh it's 9 11 right um but that doesn't mean anything right if i'm gonna sort of guide my life by that and think that that has some great significance um that's gideon's ephod it becomes a stumbling block right it becomes our god and we we c- come under a deception that somehow God is leading us when we're really just leading ourselves. Does that make sense to people? Can you see the difference? Okay, I applied a five second rule to myself. Okay. Yes. I see. I do see the difference. Yeah. Yeah, and and we need to we need to recognize these major lines, the things that are based upon prophecy. So here we have the Book of Judges, basically part of these lines, these prophetic lines from the Bible, and definitely we're a part of those lines. But those lines are guided by God by prophecy. And, and and so when we're putting these out, they're part of a structure. Now, with Colin, he finds all of these dates, which are, are a part of a structure. But he has nothing in which to interpret them because they're not on a line. And in fact, he ignores the lines that God has given us. Right? That is, right. if we understand the lines and we understand the role of Trump, Trump fulfilled his role already. Now, what what Colin tries to say is he says, well, you know, um, if we're going to take uh, um, this story in Daniel 11, verse 1 to 4, and and we're going to apply it to Revelation 17, well, we're going to see that Trump is resurrected, right? Because that's how he's doing doing this, right? He's taking these, these kings, if you understand his logic of what he's doing. He's taking the, the, the first seven kings of Persia, right? Right. And, and Xerxes is one of those kings. And, and there was this discussion when he first presents it, trying to figure out, well, how do we fit this in to, to, to Trump and the heads? Because people were saying, well, you know, five are fallen, but, you know, you got, uh, you know, Trump isn't the... Uh, the fifth head, right? He's not the fifth. And so they compared it with the presidents of the United States, right? The last, or I guess it would technically be the, the first seven presidents because we're taking the time of the end in um, 539, right? Where we have Darius the Mede. We're going to compare him to um, uh, uh, Reagan, right? And Cyrus is going to be compared to, um, uh, that would be Bush the first, right? And then you go on like that. You understand what I'm talking about. So so he was saying, well, then, you know, we can take this story and we can see that Xerxes is going to be resurrected in the form of Alexander because he says it's Persia all the way along. It's United States all the way along. This is his argument. But the problem there is that we all, always start first with the prophecy that the history in connection with this prophecy will be repeated. And we don't see Xerxes resurrected. The Greece is a different kingdom that Alexander can't represent Trump. 
right? That 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 to me was the first thing that I saw. I mean, hopefully everybody understands what I'm talking about with what Colin presented, because I'm going to present it this summer again. Present his his study, of basically what it is. Now he he has some arguments, and they're not necessarily um, easy arguments to to understand, because part of the problem. But part of or to, to, to disprove, to show why they're wrong. But part of the problem is he doesn't have a line. It is, he doesn't have these way marks that we see in any of his chronological structure. He has dates that are correct dates, because many of them are in the past, and, and they're dates that we already have, and he can see that there's a structure that connects them. So that's fine, right, because those dates exist. But we can't just say, well, because there is a structure, our conclusion is correct, because we need more than just a chronological structure. We need to be able to set these upon a line. And when we talk about a line, what we mean is a reform line. And a reform line is defined by the reform line in Millerite history. So we know in... In our history, we have December 25th, 2021, and we can definitely mark this 777 days as a reform line, right? I mean, we've done it many different ways, but this is one right here in, in the line of Jeroboam. And I, I think it's pretty hard to refute that, that FFA is first being tested and with July 19th arriving, um, a second angel arrives, and and the remnant of FFA, which I call here the refuse or the refuse, they're also going to be tested. And this would be the Protestants and the Millerites. Right? If we compare it to Adventism, this would be uh, the STA church, like the organization and leadership, and then the Levites. And, of course, we're in that that reform line right now. This is part of that. So then uh, Gideon's ephod, we can clearly see, is this structure of chronology that's being used, being misused, it becomes a stumbling block, right? And so this is something that happens in connection with the end of our lines. Very specifically, if we are going to put Gideon's ephod on a line, we would see that on December 25th, 2021, Colin brings in this revival of the Trump prediction, so to speak. He's going to say that Trump is going to uh, become president again, right? So Gideon's ephod can show, we can show specifically, this is referring to the misuse of chronology in connection with Colin's prediction. That's why it's placed at the end of that uh, uh, chiastic structure. But now we have the death of Gideon, and the death of Gideon is just another reform line. But this reform line, we're marking at April 5th, 2030. And... And so it, it ends ultimately with the death of Gideon. But even though it's the death of Gideon, it's going to be the beginning of Abimelech's line. Right? So it serves two purposes here. That is, it can show this way mark, April 5th, 2030. Because by that point, whether that's an actual date that in, in, in this time in history, but at that point where symbolically we have the end of the divorcement. It is the, the period in where uh, we're no longer dealing with this history, right? We're going to jump up out of our line, up onto the larger line. And that is, we are right now in the book of Judges, we're zooming into the arrival of the second angel's message. And the second angel's message arriving in our line is 9-11. But our whole line is a zoom into the Sunday line. 
So I don't know what April 5th, 2030 means as far as how, where we jump into that line. But at some point, we come into that way mark that we have marked as midnight. And on that line, where the second angel arriving, 9-11, is where, where we mark it as 9-11, we also know that on the bigger line, it's it's the the empowerment of the first angel's message, right? And so if it's the empowerment of the first angel's message, how, how did we make it also be the arrival of the second angel's message? That is, when we look at the line, um, I want to make this clear again because I don't don't know how to address this. Sorry. Okay. You can hear me okay? And I'm going to stop sharing the screen so you can see this properly. So if this is the time in the end, 1989, and we got uh, 1996, and we have 9-11. 9-11 is, this is the first angel arrives, this is the first angel formalized, and this is the first angel empowered, right? So where does the second angel arrive? Would that be in 2005? Okay. Um, Well, now we put it as 9-11, but remember when we do that, so I'm just going to do it this way first. So when we say 9-11 is the second angel arriving, we're actually in a different line, aren't we? Correct. Okay. So we're not really in that line. What we really have to do is we have to do this. The second angel arrives. But this second angel arriving here. Um, creates a new uh, a new reform line that is um, and I'm not really sure exactly because because I don't even understand this big reform line yet that is I'm not sure I know that Ellen White she has this Sunday law that the third angel arrives October 22 1844 and the fourth angel the other angel the second angel joins it. And when it, when it joins it, it's the Sunday law. And so we can see then that the second angel arriving here is the second angel arriving in Ellen White's history, right? Ellen White's line. Does that make sense? So technically, if you're going to look at Ellen White's line, when you get the fourth angel arriving, you also have the second angel arriving. Now we're repeating history, 
right? So before you can get the third angel, so when is the third angel empowered? Because Eloi says the second angel arrives, the fourth angel arrives, it joins the third, right? So you got the third angel way back over here. And it's continuing, right? Right, it came way back in Millerite history. So we have this second angel arrive. It's the fourth angel, but it's the second angel. And it's going to join with it. And then you have something that parallels Millerite history. It is you have the loud cry, and then you have the close of probation. So when is the third angel empowered? You understand what I'm asking? I know you can't really see that there, but. Is the third angel empowered here? And if it is, why would we choose that? Because wouldn't it be, what was that? It would have to signify that a preparation has been made to give a message so that the fourth angel's message can do its work. Okay, well, the fourth angel's message joins and empowers the third, right? So, so we know that the third angel's message is empowered by this fourth angel. But it's not empowered when it first joins the four, third angel, right? The fourth what angel. Does, you're right. Right, because it's going to swell to a loud cry. And, it's, and then the loud cry ends when probation closes. So wouldn't the close of probation, when it says, let him that is be righteous be righteous still, wouldn't that be the empowerment of the third angel? Because the third angel's message is righteousness by faith and verity. It's going to be demonstrated during that loud cry, right? Because Ellen White's talking about this process that's going to happen when this fourth angel arrives, it's going to produce this work of the third angel, which is righteousness by faith lived out in the life, right? A demonstration of the character of Christ. Now, you can say, of course, when probation closes, that this is actually another reform line that's going to happen during the plagues. Are the seven last plagues a reform line? No. Well, okay, but there's seven of them, and they, they represent something that's happening that's going to demonstrate Christ's character, because you're going to have uh, the time of Jacob's trouble, right? Right, but if the, the seven last plagues, if they were representing a reform line, it would mean that someone would have to be reformed during those plagues and i think it i think spirit of prophecy and the bible are both very clear that when those plagues are poured out probation is closed okay so we would normally think that a reform line requires uh, a reformation because that's the very definition of it right but there is a type of reformation that occurs that is um what is going to be demonstrated is Christ's character. And all along that period of the plagues, those that have been declared righteous are going to demonstrate that they are righteous. And those that have been declared wicked will demonstrate that they are wicked. So if it's a reform line, it's a reform line unlike any other. It's, it's an absolute contrast of darkness and light. That is, none of the darkness ceases to be darkness, and none of the light ceases to be light. So I would agree. It's not really a reform line, but it's a demonstration of something. So we know that God says, let him that is righteous be righteous still. 
And it's going to be demonstrated in these seven way marks that we call the plagues. Does, it, does that make sense? And, and they also parallel to some way the, the seven days of creation. But, but this is part of destruction that's coming upon the earth, right? It's, it's a, a deconstruction. So, so we have these, these symbols of reform lines after the close of probation. But of course, all reformation has been done. It's just going to be demonstrated. But you could see it's a, a deform line as far as the wicked and the world is concerned, right? Because this is destruction coming upon the earth, upon the wicked. Does any, any of the plagues fall on the righteous? Okay, so we'd have to say no, right? Now, so when we say that the second angel arrives and we put it on our line, obviously this cannot really be just the Sunday law, right? Because the Sunday law is when the second angel arrives. And so this second angel arriving be 9-11 is a line that's a step down, right? So we would know that the second angel arrives at the Sunday law on Ellen White's line. And that is, we will see the Sunday law. But we don't know when that is. We can't know when it is. Because Ellen White says we can't. And we can't take her words and, and try to put some kind of uh, interpretation that means the opposite of what they say. Because one of the basic rules of biblical interpretation, of interpreting scripture, is that no interpretation of scripture can contradict the plain statements of scripture. Right? So if we, we find something, uh, you know, in God's word, digging deep and finding this treasure, and what we call treasure contradicts the plain statements of scripture, we know it's not treasure. It's fool's gold, right? We should know that. We can't con contradict the plain statements of the spirit of prophecy. Those statements have to be true. But any light that we gain has to agree with what the plain statements of the spirit of prophecy teach. So we know we can't be setting dates because Ellen White says we can't. We have to take what she says. Now we can try to squirm around that by saying uh, we're just making speculations or we're just guessing or we're suggesting that, you know, this is going to happen in this time frame. But we know we can't. All we can do is measure the time. And then when it has happened, we will see that it was the time. Now, right now, we have dates ahead of us. And, and we can see that those dates ahead of us represent way marks on a line that we're drawing. But we don't know what that means. Right? We don't know if those are actual dates. Or we don't even know what they're pointing to if they are actual dates. You know, we can't put it April 5th, 2030 and say, that's going to be midnight, or that's going to be the Sunday law, or that's going to be whatever event we, we want it to be. You know, that's going to be when something happens in the United States or whatever. You know, especially as we approach that date, there would be a temptation if we see current events to start to predict things with those dates. And we see it all the time in this movement. It's not just Colin. Other people post things on our 2520 stuff group or post things on WhatsApp with dates in the future, suggesting because it's so many spans of time, but, you know, so many days from some other date that this, this event that we see coming up, maybe a, uh, some kind of meeting or something that's going to happen 
that that's going to be some way mark. But they, they don't even really define what those way marks are. So we know that we're guided by the way marks in Millerite history. And so if we're talking about the second angel arriving, that is the Sunday law that, that has never changed. When Ellen White talks about the Sunday law, the Sunday law in the United States, that still is future, right? But we are in the time of the Sunday law. That is, we are in a reform line that's connected to that. So I would say that we would still say, even though we can do this, we can line this up this way, um, that this is really 11.9 in this line. And what line is this? What line is 11.9 in? If the second angel arrives here at 11.9, because this is really what Jeff was pointing to. Now, when he did this, all he's seeing is that our line is the beginning of this Sunday law. That's what he was seeing. So, so this second angel arriving here, this is just this whole history being the second angel arriving as a line zoomed into. So really what he's doing is he's zooming into this and seeing this reform line. But as far as this reform line is concerned, 9-11 is not the arrival of the second angel. Does that make sense to people? 11-9 is the arrival of the second angel. This whole line is the second angel arriving in this history of the line of Ellen White. So when Jeff saw that 9-11 was the mark the arrival of the second angel, he was just recognizing that without realizing it. But 11.9 is the arrival of the second angel in this line. So where is midnight? The midnight cry in the Sunday law in this line. These... So we're going to have midnight, the midnight cry, and the Sunday law. Are these still, is this midnight still future? Because remember, Jeff had 9-11, midnight, midnight cry, Sunday law. But really what he meant was 11-9, midnight, midnight, cry, Sunday long. He just hadn't come to 11-9 yet, right? Any questions about this? And this is consistent with what Jeff was doing as he was passing through these lines, right? Remember, when Jeff was here in 1989, this was August 11th, 1840. It took time until this passed that he could mark this as August 11th, 1840. Right? So... People accused him of moving the waymarks, and people could do that with me. They could say, well, you're moving the waymarks, but I'm not. It's just as we pass through these histories, we can now recognize that what Jeff marked as the arrival of the second angel, the 9-11, he was really recognizing 11-9. Hopefully that makes sense to people. And, and we know that this way, Mark, is still future. Whatever it, whatever it is, whatever midnight is. But in this line, 
we are still zoomed into the story of the judges is zoomed into a history that goes from September 11th to 2023. So we're here in this history in 2023. Midnight is still future. We, d we don't have any way to mark that. We can't tell you, you know, April 5th, 2030 is midnight or, you know, sometime this year is midnight or sometime next year. But you can see the problem with what Colin is doing is that he doesn't have, Okay, so somebody says, please differentiate for me 11 9 and a 9 11 and 11 9. Okay, in, yeah. in, a, situa in a situation like that, um, I believe this is Brother Samuel yeah. that's asking for this. When we, when we look at the numbers, if you take a date, brother, such as September 11th, as I would express it in America, I would express that as 9-11. But on the other side, in Europe and in Africa, if we express it in the way that the dates are normally expressed there, you would have it as the 11th of September or 11-9. Now, in the same situation, we've also looked at November 9th, which can be 11-9 or 9-11. And all of those have something to do on the lines in which we have been addressing. Does that help your understanding? Okay. So we let Samuel answer that. And, and so when we see, so when we see, I, I think it's, you, 11 9 11 is when the second angel arrived so that's what he's asking so 9 11 is the second angel arriving because our entire line is the history of the sunday law right that is if you zoom into the sunday law on ellen white's line because she says the second angel arrives at the sunday law right that's what she says. Right. And and so in, in the past, Jeff would say, Revelation 18, that's the Sunday law, because that's what Ellen White says. But we then had a time at the end, which is a repetition of the first and second angels' messages. And so when we drew this line, um, originally Jeff had the time of the end, the Sunday law, the close of probation. That was his line. He had three way marks. He didn't have a formalization and empowerment at first or anything like that. He just had three way marks, first, second, and third angel's messages. And so the close of probation was the third angel's message. The Sunday law was the second, and the first angel was 1989, right? Which happens to be 11.9, by the way, okay? But then as he begin, began to go through this history, he started to recognize that there was, um, and, and originally the formalization, he didn't have a formalization of the first message. He didn't, he didn't really do that until after 9-11. Uh, so once we got to 9-11, he saw 9-11 as the first angel empowered. And so when it's the first angel empowered, he could then look at Millerite history and say, well, that's August 11th, 1840, right? That's, he lined those two up. And so then he had a place to formalize the message. But then as time went on in the movement, he saw that the second angel arrived at 9-11. Now, when he saw that, he didn't realize that he was seeing a different line. Right? So, so he was seeing September 11th. But we were now actually zooming into this second angel arriving, because that's what what the book of Judges is. It's zooming into that second, or not the book of Judges, but I guess I guess the book of Judges is a zoom into that. We'll say that. But it's a zoom into uh, September 11th to 2023. 
doesn't comprise our entire line. Doesn't go back to 1989, really. Uh, other than that 1989 to September 11 is a period of darkness because you're going to have the first angel arriving at 9-11. So, so Jeff had the first angel um, arriving at 9-11 when the second angel, uh, or pardon me, um, so he had the first angel arriving at, um, pardon me, I, I'm, I'm getting confused here. So what did he have 9-11 what was its its point? He didn't have it as a first angel arriving, as a second angel arriving. But why did he put it at 9-11? What was he doing when he did that? So he had, the first angel empowered was 9-11. And then he said, no, it's also the second angel arriving. So he brought these two together. Now, why did he do that? Does anybody remember why? He was paralleling it with Millerite history. And what had we come to discover in Millerite history? Wasn't it that that was part of the precursor before the midnight cry? Oh, right. So, so we then, see, because prior to, to understanding the first day of the first month, we had the second angel arriving in 1842, right? Right. So we had the first angel is empowered, and then we had the second angel arriving in 1842. Now, with the second angel arriving in 1842, um, we just experienced the first angel being empowered, 9-11. But we didn't really have the second angel arriving in 1842 as a point in our history. That is, we weren't not lining it up with 9-11. It was just Millerite history has this, this, this way mark, which is, and we just had it as the midnight cry, uh, or not the midnight cry. We had it as um, uh, the end of Miller's prediction, right? And then we had the midnight cry. We didn't even have midnight. So we had the midnight cry. We weren't in the midnight cry yet. And, and we really hadn't come to we weren't even really sure about where we were in these lines, right? But after we got midnight and like the midnight cry and midnight, then we could clearly say 9-11 is the arrival of the second angel. That is, if the second angel arrives in Millerite history, we had it arriving in Millerite history in 1842, but we didn't have it on our line as something that was passed, right, initially. And then we started to see, well, that second angel arriving must be connected somewhat with 9-11. We weren't sure how that was, was done. But once we had Midnight and the Midnight Cry, then Jeff created in 2016 the line where we have the first day of the first month is April 19th. The fifth day, the fifth day of the fourth month is July July twenty first. The first day of the fifth month is August fifteenth, and the tenth day of the seventh month being then October twenty two. And we had that line now, which no longer had just three way marks; it had four, right? Which is something that we had not done before. We always had the three, and originally when we drew it out, we just said, "Well, midnight and midnight cry are the same way mark," and so we would have these three main lines, and then we have this little tick to the left of the midnight cry, and we'd mark it as midnight. But we still was part of the same, the same way mark. Midnight, midnight cry was one way mark, just uh, differentiated in this way. That is, uh, you know, Samuel Snow does give the midnight cry at midnight. It's just not going to be empowered until Exeter, right? Because he's going to be there in Boston. So, so once we, we started to understand how these lines were being formed and how we were coming to understand the lines as we passed through history, Jeff had these two things. He had 9-11 is the empowerment of the first, and 9-11 is the arrival of the second. But what he didn't realize is in doing that is that one is 
We don't see that in Millerite history, right? So, so that was a bit of a problem. But, but the thing that he wasn't recognizing is that September 11th date that he called 9-11 was really referring to 11-9. So as we pass through that history, we could start to say, no, if we are looking at this line, whatever this line is of FFA, November 9th must take that place of the second angel arriving. Now, we, we had 2005 there mentioned. You know, and you could also look at 2014, because in different lines, these these years have events that are waymarks. But if we're going to look at this this bigger line of Jeff's, right, really this line that represents this entire reform line, that's going to have midnight, midnight cry, the Sunday law, the loud cry. Remember, the Sunday law and the loud cry are not really part of our line. That is, our line is just the Sunday law, right, on Ellen White's line. The loud cry is, is, is a parallel to the midnight cry in Millerite history, right, because the second angel arrives and then there's uh, this loud cry. It swells to a loud cry or the midnight cry, and then you have a close of probation. In Millerite history, that's what we have. But we have in our history a repetition of the first and second angel's messages. And in order for uh, for those messages to do their work, we're zooming into the second angel arriving. So we're just in the Sunday law history. And then it will be followed by the loud cry. And the loud cry will not be this movement giving the loud cry. It's going to be the Seventh-day Adventists who give the loud cry. They will be distinguished as Seventh-day Adventists, not as the White Stone or something else, some new name to some new movement, right? Because according to Ellen White, it's the Seventh-day Adventists. Now, is it the organized church that give the loud cry? No. No. Because can the organized church exist in a Sunday law? No. No, it can't, right? <clears throat> no, it could if it is on the side of the world and supports a Sunday law, right? But as the ones who stand in opposition to the Sunday law, that, that organization would be no more. The institutions, all of those things that comprise the organized church will be dissolved. There's no way you can stay on a ship that has uh, been destroyed in the reefs, right? The ship is not going to go to shore. But are God's people going to go to shore? Yes. Right? And we know not one will be lost. There's 276 of them. Ellen White calls it 300, right? Acts 27. Right. Okay. Now, Acts 27 represents, to some degree, the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It also represents this movement. Right? Because it comprises these people on the ship, the Levites. So, so we know... It, this is a long way around, but when we know about what we're looking at in these lines, everything that we're looking at in this chronology has to come to an end prior to midnight. That is, we're not going to be able... Now, Now we know that Ellen White says we can't predict the Sunday law and, and, and these types of things. Now, somebody could argue, well, she doesn't really talk about midnight because in our line, because she doesn't talk about our line at all, other than to say that there's a repetition of the first and second angel's messages. And we know that the repetition repetition of the first and se second angel's messages have time attached to them, right? That premise, that idea was talked about by Parminder, and that was correct. That is, since Millerite history had time, this repetition of Millerite history must also have time. And we do have time because we recognized we had time in our line. 
But his suggestion then that the counsel of Ellen White does not apply because of dispensationalism was completely false. You can never contradict the scripture, its plain statements, by just saying, you know, we're in a different dispensation. And, and he used the argument, well, uh, where Jeff had said, well, no more public evangelism. But that wasn't a dispensational argument. No, it wasn't. That was an argument of where we were in the lines. So we knew that we are in a time in which we needed to be reformed, that we couldn't do, we hadn't come to Pentecost yet. That all we would be doing is the work of the Pharisees, you know, searching sea and land to find one proselyte and make him, making him twofold more a child of hell than we ourselves are, right? Because if we're not reformed, we can't really do that work. So, so Gideon's ephod is a misuse of time. It's a stumbling block to this movement. And we need to be able to distinguish what that means. If we think that we can somehow predict some event, the timing of some event, and whether it's in, you know, in a year or, you know, it doesn't really matter. We can say, well, I'm just, it's going to happen within this time frame. It's going to happen while Trump's alive. We don't know. Right? Because we're, we're setting a, a restraint upon something that we have no control over and that we don't even really understand. And we're trying to uh, divine God's um, leading with an ephod, but it's illegitimate. Because... Who is the high priest with the ephod that we are to be following? Christ. Christ. Christ is our high priest. We need to follow where he leads. And he has given us very specific instructions on how to follow where he leads. We are to do line upon line. And you can't call it a line when it's not a line. You can't just call a bunch of dates structured into a structure with all of these symbols. You can't call that a line. Because in order for it to be a line, it has to have these way marks. And these way marks need to be defined. A period of darkness needs to be defined. The messages need to be defined. And it has to be based upon a narrative that comes from Scripture that is clearly marking and paralleling our history. And Colin's predictions do not have that. Other people on WhatsApp, their predictions do not do this. They are false prophets. They're misusing the chronology. It, it's very plain. So, so we have Gideon's ephod. It's on this line. But we also have the death of Gideon. Now, we're saying that the death of Gideon is, is part of a reform line that we would call Abimelech, right? Because it's going to, it's Abimelech's reform line is going to uh, be connected with that. And here we're placing it as April 5th, 2030. And again, that's not a specific date that we're saying that something happens on that date. But what we are saying that it indicates is that at some point along this history, um, we are going to abandon the use of chronology as far as how we've been using it. Right? That is, there's things we've learned from it. We understand these symbols, but these symbols come from the Old Testament prophecies and the New Testament prophecies. And it's the understanding of those prophecies that we are to present. Right? Everything we learned in Ezra 7 to 10. 
that addresses its connection with Millerite history. And also we can show that, that we are repeating that history in, in a broader sense. But I don't think I'm going to be presenting studies with, you know, my birthday on it and, and uh, you know, the different birthdays of different people and, you know, when people were baptized or um, even a lot of this stuff that happened in our movement. You know, the 187 days from June 21st to 22nd or 21st and 22nd to December 25th, 2020. I don't think that th is going to be part of our message. Can we see that, that that can't be our message to the Levites? Right now we have a message to this movement. Right. These lines are for this movement right now. For Correct. us to recognize the danger that we are in, to recognize the purposes of all of these things that have happened in this movement to get us back on track. See, we couldn't have just taken the position that people did, you know, after Parminder left the movement. Let's stop looking at chronology. Let's not predict this July 18, 2020 date. Because if we had done that, would we have been repeating Millerite history? The parallel would have been broken down. This movement, right. wouldn't, it wouldn't mean anything. So when we predicted that date and it failed, we were repeating Millerite history, but we were repeating hit Millerite history in Samuel Snow's letters, right? That is, we, we could look at Millerite history and say within Millerite history, there is this tip, tip, typification of October 22nd, and that's going to be Samuel Snow's letters. And so, so then we had a way to, to look at what we were doing and saying, this fits in. But Samuel Snow's letters end three days before midnight. And I still think we're in Samuel Snow's letters. I don't think we're to midnight in Millerite history yet. Now, in Millerite history, if we're going to line Millerite history up with the big line, Ellen White's line. We know that we have uh, the Sunday law, then the loud cry, then the close of probation. So if the loud cry on Ellen White's line lines up with midnight cry, where does the Sunday law line up in Millerite history? Right, because Ellen White has Sunday law, loud cry, close of probation. Are we going to line up the close of probation with October 22, 1844? We will, right? We should be able to. Right, because Ellen White lines up the midnight cry with the loud cry. Right. right? We've done that in the past. Present. What's that? And we've done that in the past. Yeah, yeah, that's what Jeff has been teaching for a long, long time. And then that is, if we're going to say that the Sunday law precedes the loud cry, right, as Ellen White says, what precedes the midnight cry in Millerite history that lines up with the Sunday law? Because the Sunday law in Millerite history is not October 22, 1844. No, it's not. Not, not on that bigger line. It would be midnight it would be the Sunday law. Right? That is Boston. All right. Right? Do you see how, how, how that would work? I'll have to examine it further, but I can, I think I understand the logic. Yeah. Okay. So, and then, and then we would say, because Jeff said 9-11 is the first day of the first month. 
Now we still accept that, right? So 9-11 is the first day of the first month. It's followed by midnight in the middle, right? That's going to be, it. you know, it's July 21st, 1844, the fifth day of the fourth month. That's still future. But then we say, well, how is it 9-11? Well, 9-11 is the arrival of the second angel's message. But 9-11 comprises much more in our line than just September 11th. It comprises this entire line. And really 9-11 comprises 11-9 and all of these things that we're experiencing. So that's Samuel Snow's letters, right? And we could see how Samuel Snow's letters uh, point to April 19th as this, this, this way mark. So we are now in this movement. If we're looking at Millerite history, we're after July 18th and before July 21st. We're in that period of three days. Now, the three days can mean different things depending on how you zoom in and zoom out. But we can't say that that three days is we, we couldn't count those three days and say, well, you know, if we counted from 21, you know, we could count 21, 22, 23, 24. And so that means that midnight is going to happen in, you know, 2024. We can't do that. Because we can't know these wave marks. Now, we might be able later on to look at things in our history, you know, in the next couple of years and see how they fit into these structures. And we might have some other study that shows that we're on such, such and such a line from such and such a history, such and such a story that's giving us light to discern where we are. But we're still going to be before midnight. Because midnight is the Sunday law. Right? On that bigger line. Correct. Correct. And we can't know when the Sunday law is going to be. Um, you know, what it reminds me of a little bit is, um, you know, if you take a, a string and you cut it in half, so you travel half the distance, whatever it is, it could be anything, you travel half the distance, and then you travel half the distance again, and you travel half the distance again, how long will it re take to reach the end? And the answer is never, because you'll you always keep being just half again as, as, as far to the end. <laughs> now, in some ways, it's like that, that as we approach this, uh, this way mark of the Sunday law, midnight, um, on that bigger line. So remember, that's the bigger line, midnight. Right? That, that's the line that Jeff created from 1989 to the close of probation. Right, 1989, Sunday law, close of probation. And we can't predict the Sunday law. So we're not to that Sunday law yet. Yet we are in the history of that Sunday law. And so it seems like another example would be, you know, when you're climbing up a, a pass or something, or you're climbing up a mountain, you get run into these false summits. You think that's the summit just up ahead. I only have, have this, you know, 100 yards to go. And then you get up there and you realize, well, there's a summit above that. That's sort of how it is. But at some point, we get to that Sunday law. And when we get there, we will know that it's the Sunday law. It's not going to be a pandemic. It's not going to be something else. It's going to be the actual Sunday law that was prophesied in the Bible and spirit of prophecy. And only then will we know that we're at that Sunday law. Okay, so we went a little over time, but wanted to clarify all of that. We'll come back to this again tomorrow. So, uh, um, and we're going to close with prayer, and then we're just going to have a discussion, Dwight, about when we're going to meet uh, this afternoon. But let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study here um, this morning. 
and for all that you're teaching us. Help us, Lord, to learn to be students in the school of Christ, to learn of his meekness and his lowliness. We pray for our brethren, and we ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit can do a work that we cannot do upon the hearts of others. We ask, Lord, that you can allow, uh, that, that we can allow your Holy Spirit to do a work upon our hearts, that we can cooperate with you in the work that you want to do in reforming our characters, and that your angels can watch over us, and that your voice can guide us through thy word. We pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank <clears throat>